All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to another Florida Talks at Home program. Uh, I am Keith Simmons. I'm the Communications Director at Florida Humanities, and we're really excited to bring you uh, this program this evening with Dr. David Head, who's going to talk about um, Spanish American pirates and privateers uh, in Florida, which I think is a very, very fascinating topic. Uh, before I introduce Dr. Head, I wanted to go over a couple of things just in case it's your first time attending a Florida Talks at Home program. Uh, normally, these programs are things that we bring to you with cultural partners around the state, but obviously that can't happen right now because of COVID-19. Um, so our goal is to make this virtual series a regular event until we can begin convening in person once again. Now, next week's event is gonna be on October 14th. That's next Wednesday at 6 p.m. And it's gonna cover Florida's sacred waters and efforts to protect these precious and fluid landscapes. You can register for that event on our Facebook page or by going to our website, floridahumanities.org. Uh, we also have a very special event coming up on October 15th at 6 p.m. That's next Thursday, featuring Florida's Secretary of State Laurel Lee. Uh, Secretary Lee is gonna be discussing the importance of civic engagement and why being a savvy consumer of information matters now more than ever. We're really excited to have that program with her. Uh, at the end of tonight's presentation, you will receive a short feedback survey in your email. We would greatly appreciate it if you took a minute to fill it out. Um, if you have any questions for the speaker during the presentation, um, feel free to type them in the chat box below. That's going to be the way that I'll keep track and then I'll facilitate a Q&A with Dr. Head um, at the end of his presentation. Uh, your support is essential for helping to sustain these programs. Uh, and if you enjoy tonight's program, we ask that you consider visiting floridahumanities.org slash support to contribute to Florida Humanities and to help us continue to bring these programs to the public. And again, tonight we welcome Dr. David Head, who's a lecturer in history at the University of Central Florida. His work focuses on the American Revolution, the Founding Fathers, the early American Republic, the Atlantic world, maritime history, and what I think is the coolest part, pirates and privateers. And he's published several books on privateers and piracy. And so we're going to uh, now turn it over to Dr. Head. Well, well thank you for that, that introduction. And thank you to everyone for, uh, for tuning in tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your, your schedules to, to join me to talk about some privateers and pirates uh, here in Florida. Or as my, uh, my six-year-old, my daughter likes to say, pirates. That's how she pronounces it when we talk about uh, pirates. Um, I, think I, I like that way. That, that's pretty fun. So what I'm going to talk about today is an episode uh, in Florida's history from the 18 teens when Florida was still a part of Spain's empire. And this is part of the story um, that's involved with how Florida became part of the United States. So during that, that sort of crucial period of transition from one power to the other is the period that I'll be talking about. Now, before I get to the main action, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the background to our story to uh, give you some context so you can fill in this period that is often, um, it's often unfamiliar uh, to people. Um, oftentimes, if you're uh, know a little bit about Florida or you're, you've been born somewhere else, like, like I was uh, down here as an adult, uh, sort of Florida's history is kind of a, a mystery to you. Um, mystery to me, certainly in many ways, uh, before you know, the 20th century when the explosion and growth really happened in Florida and still continues to this day. And Florida, of course, has a very long history dating back um, uh, centuries. Um, of course, before the Europeans arrived and even after Europeans arrived, so centuries of history here in Florida. And so the background of our, of our story has to do with uh, the status of Spain's empire in the early 19th century. Florida, as one of Spain's colonies, um, was a part of the process of the Spanish-American Wars of Independence, where Spain's colonies in the Americas, uh, North and South America, were involved in seeking independence from Spain. Now, how the colonies came to seek independence has to do actually with the Napoleonic Wars that were going on in Europe at the same time. These are the wars in which um, uh, the uh, Emperor Napoleon of France was fighting against the various other uh, European powers for dominance on the continent. 
part of uh, Napoleon's strategy was to uh, conquer Spain and its neighbor Portugal. And Spain invaded, uh, I'm sorry, Napoleon invaded Spain in 1808. Now, of course, the Spanish don't like this, being invaded by their, uh, their French neighbors. And there are a number of people who form a resistance government to resist uh, Napoleon's control over Spain um, and to force Napoleon out of Spain eventually is their goal. Now, these, uh, this resistance government, they go by the name of juntas. These juntas are formed to resist Napoleon's uh, conquest. Now, very importantly, many of these juntas, they are formed not seeking independence in the very beginning, but rather they are seeking to expel the French and then eventually to restore the king, the Spanish King Ferdinand. It's the idea is that they will uh, be governing only temporarily, but in the king's name. Well, that effort to govern temporarily dovetails with uh, some other people's thinking that they would like to seek independence. So in this sort of chaotic situation, when Napoleon is invaded, some people are forming these, this, these governments uh, these, uh, to govern without the, the, the uh, king, but supposedly only to bring the king back in the future. Some of those get taken over by people who want independence. So some of these juntas begin declaring independence from Spain, um, beginning in 1811. And uh, the picture I have there is the uh, Declaration of Independence in Venezuela, which also happens on uh, July 4th, uh, 1811, just by uh, coincidence. Now, these juntas that are declaring independence, they are fighting against Spain, but they're also fighting against other um, other colonists in Spanish America. So they're fighting against both Spain and colonists in Spanish America who would like to remain loyal to the king. Uh, and of course, everybody that is loyal to Spain in one way or another, Spanish America is fighting against Napoleon. So you have multiple, multiple sides to this. Uh, colonists against each other, some being loyal to Spain, others uh, wanting independence. The Spanish against the French. Okay, so you have all those different elements together. Now, one of the ways in which these um, independent seeking juntas in uh, Spanish America, one of the ways that they seek to fight against Spain is by commissioning privateers. Now that simply raises the question of what is a privateer? So a privateer is, the name refers to both men, the sailors are privateers, uh, but the name private, the word privateer also can refer to the ship that the men sail. So it can be used interchangeably. So privateer is both the ship and the men that sail it. Okay? So those are both to be called privateers. So a privateer ship is a ship that is privately owned. Uh, so in that sense, it is not a naval vessel, which is publicly owned, that is owned by the government. Okay? So privateer is privately owned, but it is a warship. So like a naval vessel in that it's a warship, but different from a naval vessel in that it is privately owned. So privateers are privately owned warships. They are commissioned during times of war to attack enemies. So a privateer will carry a, a, a document. In the 19th century, it's called a commission. In the 17th, 18th century, it was called a letter of mark, kind of a more elaborate title. Uh, it's either, either, either name, it is a license that empowers the crew of the privateer to capture enemy vessels, to kind of participate in a nation's war making powers, even though it is a privately owned vessel. What motivates privateers, uh, partly they want to, you know, help their country win, but what makes privateering possible is the financial motive of the participants. So. Privateers, when they capture an enemy vessel, that captured vessel is called a prize, like a prize of war. And the captors of the prize, they get to keep what they capture. And so when a privateer captures an enemy vessel, it will uh, take that vessel and it will um, set, put a crew aboard, they'll send it uh, into port, and a legal proceeding takes place in which uh, evidence is presented and uh, if the privateers have followed the rules of war, then they get to keep the goods that they've captured. And then those goods are di uh, divided up uh, amongst the crew. There's a schedule usually 
the owners get up the biggest cut, then the captain, and then the officers, and then all down the way, the ranks to the most inexperienced seamen. Everybody gets something, right? not equally, but they all get uh, the proceeds of their capture. I should mention, it's really the, it's the money, the proceeds of the sale of the goods that they have captured. They don't like, you know, split up bags of sugar or something and dole out the blood cup to one guy or another like that. It's the proceeds of the sale that is what they're dividing. Now, privateers, critically, they are not pirates because they have this commission. So even though they are private actors, private individuals, they have a commission that makes their captures legal. Okay? And privateers exist only during times of war. So during times of war, you have privateering. During times of peace, they're not really, they're not privateers. It's only during times of war that privateering exists. Okay. Now this raises a, the other question, what is a pirate? So a pirate, or let me use my, my daughter's pronunciation, a pirate, um, is someone who captures enemy, uh, the, could capture ships. I caught myself there, I said enemy ships, so they're not really enemies in the sense there's no declared war. Um, the capture ships on private authority, right? their own authority, which is to say no real authority other than that they want to take something. Right? So no legal authority justifying what a pirate takes. So this is robbery. Pirates attack anybody at any time. Again, like thieves would do. And thieves don't only operate during times of war, they operate at any time. Okay? So pirates are essentially thieves at sea who take ships, take their goods without any commission or license empowering them to uh, take those actions. Okay, so that's the difference between the privateers and the pirates. This is an example of a privateering commission that was issued by one of the, 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 the groups that I'll be talking about in a second. And you can see these are really fun to, to find in the archives. I found a number of these. They're often large uh, documents. So um, they're very sizable. I mean, you know, they're like this. You can hold them. You can kind of fold them out. Um, and they're part form letters. You can see a lot of this is printed as kind of boilerplate stuff. And you fill in the name of the captain, the name of the vessel, how many cannon the vessel had, uh, how many men that they, they have. And then it's signed by a couple of authorities here. You get the date when it's signed. Oftentimes, privateering commissions, they, they have an expiration date uh, that varies. And then there's a big wax seal down here. And so this that this is a document that's always fun to, to find. Um, you can see this is the actual commission that makes their captures legal. Okay. We are almost there to the main story. I know you're antsy to hear about the, uh, the, the actual activities of the people. But just one more, one more example of context here. Uh, what exactly is Florida at this point is something that I think is helpful to get a handle on. Uh, under the Spanish in this period, in the 18 teens, there are actually two colonies that are called Florida. There is East Florida and there is West Florida. Okay, so East Florida is most of today's state, is East Florida. And then West Florida is um, mostly the Panhandle, and but the Panhandle extends beyond the borders of Florida today. And the Panhandle of Florida, what well, was West Florida, extended into what's today the bottom little notches of uh, Alabama, Mississippi, and then a piece of Louisiana to the Mississippi River. The border here is the, uh, between East and West Florida, is the Apalachicola River, which is near Tallahassee, I believe. Um, I, I believe this is also the border of the uh, uh, Eastern and Central time zone. I remember when I used to travel on, on I-10 uh, more frequently than I do today, that was where you kind of uh, cross over from one time zone to the other and either make up an hour or you lose an hour crossing there. So basically, eastern time zone Florida is east Florida, and um, central time zone Florida was west Florida, plus Alabama, little bits of Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Uh, east Florida has its capital in St. Augustine. West Florida's capital was Pensacola. Now, Florida was like, this was the central part of European colonization settlement in Florida in this time. Basically, the I-10 corridor. That's where the Europeans had settled. Most of this was unsettled. Most of the, 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 the body of Florida um, was unsettled in the uh, 18th, 19th century. 
unsettled by Europeans, I should say. There are various Native Americans who live here, of course. Uh, the, both Floridas were loyal to Spain during Spain's wars of independence. They did not seek their independence at that time. So they were loyal to Spain. Uh, the other major colonies that were loyal to Spain included Cuba and Puerto Rico. So really those four are the four that did not seek independence. The two Floridas, Cuba, and Puerto Rico. Now, there's not a large European population in East Florida in the early 19th century. There's actually not a lot of economic activity um, that would draw people to the Floridas. There are some plantations and there's some agriculture, but not in large numbers. The reason why Spain hangs on to Florida is strategic and it has to do with the way the winds and the currents force ships to sail in the 19th century, because all, at this point, all ships are sailing ships. Uh, the way the currents of the winds force you to sail from the Caribbean back to Spain, you can't go directly back. You have to kind of curve around, stop in Havana, and then go up this way through the uh, channel here. There's a channel here that you can go through um, with the Bahamas on the one side and the mainland of, of Florida on the other side. That's fairly narrow. Uh, around the Bahamas, there's a lot of shoals, a lot of shallow water. So you can't really cut through the Bahamas. You have to go up through this, this channel here. Now, if you were an enemy of Spain, or if you were a pirate, the logical place you would just wait is at the top of that channel. You would just sit there, knowing that the Spanish ships, if they're going to go home to Spain, they have to come up this way. That's the way they have to go. They can't... They can't go a different way because they're sailing straight into the wind. They'll never get anywhere. They can't sneak to the Bahamas because it's too shallow. They have to be up here. So St. Augustine really exists to protect trade and sea travel that comes through this, that region okay, so that the Spanish can have a naval force there and can kind of see, oversee this area to keep it clear of enemies and pirates. Okay, so that's why the Spanish have a presence in Florida. Okay, so putting all those things together, the definition of pirates versus privateers, the uh, Spanish-American Wars of Independence that were begun as part of the uh, Napoleonic Wars, and the status of Florida and its peculiar geography of the, of the seas there. That's just gonna explain a lot of the episode that follows. Okay, so finally, we get to some guys doing some things. Uh, some invading and some privateering, some pirate-like activities. There are two phases uh, that I wanna talk about the Spanish-American kind of invasions of uh, Spanish East Florida. And the first phase begins with a man named Gregor McGregor. Actually, he always went by Sir Gregor McGregor. Yes. And he was also like, he attained the rank of general at one point. So he was Sir General Gregor McGregor. Uh, I love that name. You, you, you find these names, you can't make that up, right? It's, it's Gregor McGregor. He was a British officer. And he had served in the Napoleonic Wars, uh, principally in Portugal and in um, uh, Spain in the Peninsular Campaign, that portion of the Napoleonic Wars. He claimed that he was a nobleman, although suspiciously, the source of his claim to nobility changed. Uh, he changed his story from one telling to another. Um, in one version, he was the son of a Scottish lord, so he had been born into his nobility. On other occasions, he claimed that he received a knighthood by virtue of his service in Portugal, that the King of Portugal knighted him for his brief service um, in the alliance Britain had with Portugal. Uh, you can maybe guess that there probably was no real claim to nobility, but he liked the title. So, you know, there's no Google to check up on people, so you can kind of just present himself this way. At one point during... Uh, his service in Portugal, McGregor got into a fight uh, with some fellow officers and he had a falling out with his commander. He resigned his commission in the British army and then he traveled to Venezuela where roughly around the same time, uh, the Venezuelan army, they really needed experienced European trained officers to help with their, uh, get their army into shape and to lead their military in its fight against the, the Spanish royalists. So this was McGregor uh, exactly the kind of person that, that they wanted, someone who had trained European, uh, European methods. So McGregor signs up, he becomes an officer in the Venezuelan uh, army, 
He rises to the rank of general. He, uh, you know, he gets to know uh, Simone Bolivar. He marries, I believe, a cousin of Simone Bolivar, which helps him in his kind of the politics of uh, the army. So that helps him have a role in the Venezuelan army. McGregor, though, on, an, on a, another occasion, he repeats his past circumstances. He has another argument with a uh, with one of the other officers. He has a falling out with the uh, commanders of the Venezuelan army, and he decides to go out on his own to raise his own army, his own expedition. He doesn't have to take orders from anybody anymore. And that's what brings him to the United States. So in early 1817, Gregor McGregor, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry there, uh, Gregor. Uh, I should call him Sir General McGregor. Uh, Got to get the title right. So Sir, uh, Sir General McGregor comes to the United States and he re has a plan to recruit men and gather supplies in the United States. He comes to Philadelphia first and foremost. Uh, Philadelphia was also, was also was, uh, a center of uh, Spanish-American activity in this period. Um, many period people came to the United States trying to lobby the United States for support to uh, formally recognize the independence-seeking uh, colonies, or the independence-seeking former colonies, I should say, get the United States involved in that war. And Philadelphia is a major port. They settled there, and they kind of organized their activities to um, encourage Americans to participate in those wars. Spanish-American independence movements were fairly popular in the United States. As you can imagine, many Americans saw this as, you know, like Act Two of the American Revolution. Except this time, it's Spain's colonies against Spain, another monarchy. Uh, that was perfectly fine. But it is illegal to participate in a foreign war. So what McGregor was doing, recruiting men to serve the fight against Spain, that was illegal. So you have to be kind of on the slide on this. So he recruited men, gathered supplies. He obtained a commission from some of the Spanish American agents who were operating in uh, Philadelphia. And he, this he takes as kind of the blessing of those governments to go ahead with his plans. We get some kind of official backing for what he's doing. The um, uh, third part of his plan was to attack Amelia Island. So Amelia Island, of course, off the coast of uh, Spanish East Florida, uh, off the coast of Jacksonville today. Um, and that was the, the uh, place that he was uh, going to launch his invasion of, uh, kind of off the coast up here. I'm sure some of you have been to, uh, have been to Amelia Island. So that's what his, um, his goal was. His, his goal is conquer Amelia Island, there's a, a Spanish a town, Fernandina was there. And his goal was to establish a base of operations where he could sponsor privateering, hand out commissions, engage in smuggling. So take the goods the privateers captured, smuggle those into the United States, then that would finance his operation. He would get some resupply. He arranged for a ship to travel from New York to bring more men and supplies to Amelia Island. And then once he kind of reorganized himself to push on to the mainland of Florida. Or go attack St. Augustine itself. And then who knows how far that he would go. So the goal was to conquer Florida from that base of operations in Amelia Island. The long-term strategic goal was to open a new front in the war against Spain. Okay. So the idea being that if, Sp if East Florida were seeking its independence, then Spain would have to divert resources, men and material and weapons, all that kind of stuff, away from other places like Mexico or um, Venezuela or, or uh, Argentina or any of the places that were fighting for independence. So they have to has limited resource, would have to redirect some of those to Florida. And that would make the independence movement in those other places take pressure off of them and make it more possible that these various colonies would win their independence. That's kind of McGregor's thinking. Open up a new front in the war, make Spain defend it. Uh, why Amelia Island? Let me talk a little bit more in depth about why Amelia Island. Uh, why that would be such an excellent base. Why he picked that place and not somewhere else. This is a modern Google Maps here, you can see. Um, the fact that Amelia Island is right on the border with Georgia is significant. Because in the 19th century, that border with Georgia is the border between Spain and the United States. So the United States' territory ends at St. Mary's River. So here, that's one, that's Spain, 
up here that is the United States. Um, it would be good for private chair because there's a, a nice port there. Fernandina has a port that is easy to enter. It's protected from the uh, the, the waves and the, the width here. Uh, so Fernandina Beach is over here. Uh, well, today's Fernandina Beach. They renamed it Fernandina Beach, I believe, in the 20th century to emphasize its connection to the beach for tourism reasons. Uh, but that's not what McGregor is concerned about. So it would be good for private chair, good for smuggling, good place to resupply, so accessible from the outside world. The ship from New York can come resupply. Really what McGregor, the advantage he finds in, in uh, Amelia Island is that he gets the both best of both worlds in the sense of being close to the United States, its economy, its markets, its manpower to, to recruit people, but his outside U.S. legal system. So he can make his own rules if he is successful in conquering that island. So he can make his own laws, but he can have access to American, uh, American markets. To, uh, so, uh, to sell his goods and to generate money that way. Okay, so it can be close to his ports, but outside US law. That's really advantageous. Okay. The invasion of itself takes place in June of 1817. June 29th is when McGregor the, uh, marches his forces onto Amelia Island. He uh, recruited in Philadelphia, then he also traveled uh, to Savannah, to, uh, uh, well, first to Charleston, South Carolina, then to Savannah. The recruiting men as he went, building up his forces. Finally, he has several hundred men, and they attacked Amelia Island at the end of June. Had about a hundred men or so, and they were able to scare away the Spanish defenders, who were only numbered about a dozen or so um, in the the kind of garrison little fort that they had at Amelia Island. And so it kind of shows up with overwhelming numbers. The actual invasion is, is kind of anticlimactic. There's no great battle. There's no dramatic fighting. They show up, the Spanish know they're overwhelmed, and they, they retreat. McGregor uh, sets up shop, and he proclaims this new place, uh, excuse my Spanish here, La República de las Floridas. Yeah, that's not really good Spanish pronunciation, is it? No. Um, I try my best. So that is the Republic of the Floridas. We'll do the English, English pronunciation, the uh, English um, uh, translation there. And so that's what he proclaims. So a new, a new country, a new, something new that he has created. Uh, this is the flag here. You can see the, the, the flag, the Green Cross of Florida. I'll give you one guess whose design it was. McGregor's, of course. Uh, he dabbled uh, not only in uh, being a military officer, but also in flag design. He's a graphic, his own graphic designer there. Uh, McGregor, another little thing that he did to commemorate the great victory at Amelia Island is he had a commemorative medal struck. And the, uh, the saying here around the, the edges says, Amalia, vini vini vici. Uh, and on the other side of Libertas Floridarium Duce Mac Gregorio. So you, if you recall, and you've had Latin lessons, and you call your classics, uh, the vini vini vici, uh, that is what Julius Caesar wrote after the conquest of Gaul. I guess they say they say that the visa W. So we need wiki wiki, or wiki, depending on your Latin pronunciation. And so he came, Amelia Island. McGregor came. He saw. He conquered, just like Caesar. That's who McGregor thinks he is in the company of. Right, so Julius Caesar and his 19th century reincarnation, Sir General McGregor. Uh, and also that he names himself a Latin name, Mac Gregorio there. Okay. So you get a picture of what McGregor's personality was like. Yeah, very sort of vainglorious. McGregor's, uh, his leadership of Amelia Island, this, this first phase, does not last very long. Um, in July of 1718, as McGregor kind of tries to consolidate his power, it turns out that there's very little privateering. Not too many ships show up looking for a McGregor privateering commission. And what privateers he does commission tend to be very small vessels that mostly raid along the coast of Florida. They don't capture other vessels at sea. They raid plantations along the coast. That's primarily what they do. Uh, with little privateering bringing in few goods, there's not much to smuggling, so not much smuggling takes place. Uh, there is there is some smuggling, and there's also some uh, a capture of enslaved people that McGregor will, will try to sell into Georgia 
where, uh, where, where slavery is practiced. Uh, the international slave trade at this point, to bring enslaved people in from abroad into the United States is illegal. It's illegal, after, legal everywhere in the United States after 1808. Uh, so that is against the, the law in the United States, but Gregor does it anyway, in, in some, some small numbers. There are significant resupply problems in August. The ship that McGregor had arranged to come from New York, it has problems getting out of the port of New York. The collector of customs was on his game and he could see this, this vessel that was fitting out and it had a small number, it, has a, it had a large number of men, much larger than you would need for a typical merchant, uh, typical merchant voyage which is what the captain claims he's undertaking. So, so it has a lot of guys, and it has a lot of guns, I mean, far more arms than you would need if you're just gonna go on a, a, merchant, uh, a merchant voyage. Uh, so the collector is wondering, why do you have so many men, and why do you have so many guns? And what can the captain say? I, I get lonely and I like to shoot with my friends? No, the collector knows that, that something's up. So he detains the ship until the number of men and the guns aboard matches what a what a merchant voyage should be. Uh, I should mention it is illegal for uh, someone to uh, equip a vessel of war to participate in a foreign war in the United States. Uh, so what these guys are doing, signing up to go fight in a foreign war, is illegal. And um, the collector of customs at New York makes them take all the, the guys and the stuff off until they have just like a merchant voyage uh, will be proper to that kind of voyage, which is what it says on the paperwork. Well, then the ship shows up in Amelia Island. He doesn't have the manpower that he's expecting, doesn't have the supplies that he's expecting. His McGregor's planned invasion of mainland Florida is not gonna go very well. At the same time, McGregor hears rumors, reports, that a Spanish counterattack is coming. The Spanish, of course, weren't just gonna let uh, Amelia Island go. They regroup in St. Augustine, and they're preparing to attack and retake Amelia Island. McGregor looks at all this stuff and says, this isn't going to work, and he abandons Florida. He, he sails away from Florida, gives up on the, ex the whole expedition, and goes to figure out something else in the future. Second, phase two commences uh, in, um, in, in August. In August, early September, the uh, the se several men. So McGregor leaves, but some of the the men stay behind, and they decide that they're going to defend Amelia Island. The kind of remnant that's left behind, they decide they'll defend Amelia Island. They're going to try and make a go of things still, even without McGregor. The remnant of McGregor's forces, they're actually successful in defeating the Spanish counterattack. So that counterattack fails, and the remnant is in charge. Uh, Amelia Island still is an independent, uh, independent province or independent country for two days until, just by coincidence, uh, a new commander shows up, a man named Louis Michel Ori, and he takes out, he takes charge of what McGregor had left behind. Just kind of shows up. He's, he, he actually, it's not entirely a coincidence. He was looking for McGregor, but McGregor's not there. And okay, this guy's out of the way. I'll take over. That is Ori's plan. So who is Louis Michel Ori? You can guess by his name that he is French. So he was born in France, and he had uh, come to the Caribbean as a French, uh, aboard a, a French uh, naval vessel, and then he had uh, left the French Navy and become a French privateer. Had a, a French privateering commission sailing in the Caribbean, fighting against the, the English principally in the, uh, the first decade of the 19th century. Then once the uh, Spanish-American Wars of Independence uh, began, he went into the Spanish-American service. He uh, sailed as a, as a uh, commander in the Cartagena Navy. Cartagena today is a city in Colombia, but at this point it was a city-state that was kind of fighting for its independence from Spain, but also from the other juntas in uh, what's today, Colombia, to get some taste of the complexity there. So, Rory was a, a Commodore in the Cartagena Navy. Uh, Cartagena falls to the Spanish in 1815, so um, Rory needs a new base of operations. At first, he uh, travels to Haiti, 
which was independent at, the, at this point. The Haitian Revolution had been successful, so they're an independent Haiti. And uh, Simone Bolivar is also in Haiti. And Simone Bolivar is kind of regrouping, kind of figuring out what to do next. Uh, Ori is there with him, but he runs afoul of uh, Ori. Uh, I'm sorry, Ori runs afoul of Bolivar and decides to kind of strike out on his own. You, you can, you know, that should echo what McGregor just did. These guys have a problem with taking orders, problem with authority. Ori, uh, in 1815, 1816, he fell in with some uh, Mexicans, uh, independent uh, members of the Mexican independence movement. These members of the Mexican independent movement, they were starting what was known as a filibuster. A filibuster is not a delaying technique in a legislative body like it is today. A filibuster in this part of the 19th century was a private military adventure. So a military force that is sort of privately organized, not part of an, like, an official uh, state's military, but a private military force and the expedition against an enemy. So just as privateers are a private sort of naval force, a filibuster is a private army force. Um, so Orvi falls in with these guys and agrees to perform, provide them with, uh, with uh, for naval water, not naval official, uh, a water-based support for their operations. So he sets up um, and helps invade uh, an island off the coast of Texas, today's Texas, called Galveston. Texas in this period was uh, part of Mexico and part of a Mexico that was vying for its independence from Spain. Okay, so Galveston, Texas, part of Mexico, right, and a part of a place that was vying for its independence, an independent Mexico from Spain. Yeah, it gets complicated who's who and where, where and what's what in this period. Okay. Ori operated out of Galveston for a couple of years, but he was eventually uh, muscled out of the way by two men whose names you may know, if you know anything about early American history, the War of 1812 in the United States, specifically in New Orleans. The two men were named Jean and Pierre Lafitte, who had uh, been operating in New Orleans uh, in the 18-teens. They participated in the, in the uh, War of 1812. And after the War of 1812, the Lafittes actually uh, acted as spies on behalf of Spain. They were spying on the operations of Ori and others at Galveston. The Lafitte's went to Galveston to spy on Ori's operations there and then end, and ended up taking it over for themselves. So again, it gets complicated. Who's who and what's what and who's serving who and all that kind of thing. So the Lafitte's muscled Ori out of the way. Ori then sailed, uh, hearing about this uh, settlement that McGregor has in Amelia Island, sails to East Florida, and takes over the, uh, Amelia Island, kind of what the Lafitte's just did to him back in Texas. This is a picture here. This is the only image I've ever been able to find of Luis Michel Ori. It's said to be a self-portrait, but I can neither uh, confirm, uh, I can confirm neither that it's a portrait of Ori, or if it is a portrait of Ori, that Ori did it himself. But as this is the only image, that's the only one I have to, to show, so I put it here and, um, just put that, that caveat uh, attached to it. Uh, Ori is more successful in Amelia Island than, uh, than McGregor was. So he was uh, more aggressive in privateering and he welcomed more privateers to Amelia Island. One estimate, one newspaper estimate um, said that in the, uh, the fall of 17, uh, oh, sorry, the fall of 1817, there was some $500,000 worth of prize goods moved through Amelia Island in the fall of 1817. That's roughly equivalent to about $5 million today if you, if you, if you do that kind of conversion. Ori was a, a prolific uh, slave trader. So that's one of the things he did uh, as a French privateer earlier in his career, something that happened at Galveston also. So uh, trading in captured slave vessels and moving those people into the United States. He uh, had pretensions to found in a kind of respectable independent government. So he, he was uh, wanted to be an official recognized government. So he was drafting a constitution that would be modeled on the US Constitution. That's something that was going on at that period. 
Orrery really benefited from some loopholes in U.S. law that made it very difficult for the United States to respond to what Orrery was doing. They, they knew what was going on, but the law made it difficult for the United States to intervene. Um, Orrery would smuggle goods and enslave people into Georgia via rowboats. And the rowboats were so small that they were not covered by the law that empowered customs agents to stop them. The customs agents, they were only empowered to stop vessels of a certain size and above. The theory being, I guess, that with limited manpower, a small vessel cannot bring in enough really goods to make the trouble of, you know, of, of, uh, of inspecting it worth the while. Well, okay, that's fine if you just do this once or twice, but Ori is doing this all the time. And a report from a U.S. official says, says that they can smuggle one or two, one or two shiploads at a time without detection. So they move these people in, and you know, even if they know about it, they can't really intervene. Um, also, the United States declares itself neutral between Spain and its colonies. And as a neutral, the United States cannot give aid to one side that it does not give to the other. So it has to give, recognize both sides. And just as the United States recognizes Spain as a legitimate belligerent in the war, it recognizes Spanish American colonies as a legitimate belligerent in the war. So the Spanish uh, ambassadors complain all the time. They say, like, just go stop these guys. You know what they're doing is wrong. They're, they're rebels in rebellion against just authority. Just go stop them. And the Americans have to say, no, you guys are equal in this war. We have to treat you equally. A U.S. Naval commander writes to his, uh, the Secretary of the Navy and says, I know what's going on, but as I considered, it was neutral ground, and it was the wish of the government not to infringe. He had to let them go because he had received no orders to treat the Spanish-American vessels any differently than a Spanish vessel. Uh, this is, a, again, a privateering commission here. And you can see the, the Spanish here at the, at the beginning. Um, Rory uh, styles himself the leader of the uh, armed and the forces by, by sea and land of the Floridas. The, the commander-in-chief of the Floridas is how Rory sees himself. The United States eventually does decide to intervene militarily in Florida. The problem, of course, is that this is territory outside the United States and is sure to offend somebody if the United States intervenes. Um, they would, like, they're going to offend the Spanish Americans and their cause that's popular in the United States if they chase Ori out of here when he's claiming to be part of a legitimate government um, that he served on behalf of the, the commission received from the leaders of the Mexican independence movement. The Spanish are also gonna be angry because they claim this as their territory. They're gonna think the United States is gonna take over all of it, which is a fairly, uh, is, is they're not being overly suspicious when they suspect the United States of wanting to add all that territory to the United States. Treaty negotiations are also underway between the United States and Spain over um, the floors which the United States wants to acquire and also the border between the United States and Spain which had never really been settled, where that border is in Texas and in uh, Louisiana and out to the western part in the Oregon Territory. So settling all those questions was something that negotiations were underway. And the United States makes a false move here that could upset those, those negotiations. President at the time is James Monroe, and he is recently in, in office, taking office in 1817. And this was really his first foreign policy decision that he has to make. He, has, he decides eventually to, to invade Amelia Island because of four factors. First, the United States, uh, there are significant violations of U.S. law, slave trading laws, uh, slave smuggling laws, smuggling of goods laws, uh, participant by, uh, neutrality violations, piracy laws. And those are all laws in the U.S. that were being violated through Amelia Island. Amelia Island was actually the fourth center of this kind of pirate privateer activity. I mentioned Galveston before. I mentioned in passing New Orleans was a center of this activity before. Baltimore was also a center of this activity. So coming forth, it just looks like this problem is getting worse and worse and worse. And if they don't act, there might be a fifth, sixth, seventh center of this operations in the United States attacking Spain. And that this looks like the problem is getting much worse. Uh, the U.S. government decided that they did not have to respect the governments founded by McGregor or Ory. McGregor received his commission in Philadelphia, which was a violation of federal neutrality law. You don't have to respect that. 
Uh, the U.S. government, Monroe decided he had no idea how Ori's commission from Mexico empowered him to be a governor of a province in Florida. Like, that's too far apart. And then that's just kind of made up. So that's the decision. You don't have to respect that. Finally, there was a secret law that was handy in this period called the No Transfer Resolution of 1811. And the No Transfer Resolution empowered the president to use force if it looked like Spanish Florida was going to fall into the hands of any power other than Spain. The law is designed to make sure that Spain kept the Floridas so that Spain could give the Floridas legally to the United States. So that's what the law was passed. And it was made secret for fear that if they made this law public, then a country like uh, Britain would act first before the United States could get its forces in and lined up. Then they would just take that over then uh, Flor Spain would not have Florida to trade to the United States at any point in the future. Okay, so a secret law that just came in handy at that particular time. So all those reasons Monroe chooses invasion. John Quincy Adams, Monroe's uh, Secretary of State, says it bluntly, break up the marauders. Monroe does not say okay, but that's his sentiment. When the uh, time comes at the end of, 17, of 1817, it's also anticlimactic when the United States shows up. The Army Navy lands and they have overwhelming force, or he decides to leave. The United States does not give Amelia Island back to Spain, and the treaty that is concluded, uh, tentatively agreed to in 1819 and then formalized a couple years later, um, gives all of the Floridas to the United States. So it's moot then what to do with Florida. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. I have uh, some information there if you'd like to stay in touch in the future. And I will look forward to uh, answering questions here. But if you have questions that you don't get a chance to ask or you think of something, you know, if there's something gnawing at you, you're about to fall asleep and you're like, oh, yes, I should have asked that question, then please uh, contact me here in the future. I'll be happy to answer any questions that come up in the future. Thank you again for um, listening today. And I look forward to continuing our conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for that presentation, Dr. Head. And um, I know we've got a couple people, I think, typing right now with some questions, and there's a few that uh, came up, I think, throughout your presentation. And one of the ones I think I'd like to start with is, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, romanticism around pirates and, and um, piracy. Um, what would you say is probably the biggest misconception out there um, when it comes to pirates and, and piracy that you hear? Like, what's the one thing that when someone talks about it, it just kind of makes you cringe because it's just not, it's just not true? Right. Probably the, the misconception that's connected to many other specific things is the idea that being a pirate was fun, um, that it was kind of carefree and you got to make your own rules, you get to do whatever you want. Um, I guess that's true. You're not, uh, you don't have to face the discipline of, of a Navy, which could be extremely harsh, or the kind of discipline that was aboard a merchant ship, which could also be very harsh. Um, so you didn't have those things. But being a pirate, I mean, it was violent. And, and being at sea in any capacity is extremely difficult in the age of sail. The privations, the, 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 the risk of, of uh, dying at sea through a shipwreck, or being attacked by an enemy, or all the different ways you could get sick and die. Uh, being a pirate was not fun. Most pirates lasted only a couple of years, and that is, we can't really call it a career, um, because they would eventually end up in, in kind of violent deaths. Either they were captured or they were killed. Uh, your shipmates aboard a pirate ship are not, <laughs> these are not the most sociable people. Um, you know, there's often, you're there with violent criminals. And I think that's the myth that ties into a lot of other uh, mythologies surrounding pirates. But somehow this was fun and carefree, and you get to, you know, sit on, a, on, a, um, on uh, in the, the breezy air of a ship and drink rum all day. Yeah, I guess, but there would be reasons why you want to be drunk all the time, because life is extremely hard. Um, that's what it's really like to be, to be a pirate, a very difficult life. And you hinted at something really interesting. You talked about uh, discipline on mm -hmm. a traditional naval vessel, or even on a merchant vessel. I mean, can you talk to us a little bit about what some of that discipline was like? I mean, what what was it? What what is it that makes it seem so bad? Like, oh, maybe piracy could be a little bit better, or right? Or, so, 
comparison. Yeah, so so in the navies, um, Royal Navy, for example, the British Navy, American Navy, French Navy, I mean, you can be flogged, like you know, whipped, beaten hundreds of times for even uh, my, my, minor infractions. Uh, you know, if, if you're hungry and you take some food that does an extra ration or something like that, you can be you know given hundred lashes easily. Uh, so that kind of harsh physical discipline is something that's just it's just endemic for all kinds of uh, what we consider mi minor infractions. Uh, there is that kind of, there are rules and things like that aboard a pirate vessel. There, you do need to kind of coordinate the actions of probably about 100 guys or so. And there are some things that you're not supposed to do, like smoke. You don't want to smoke aboard a ship or leave, you know, uh, leave, leave your pipes going because you could blow up the whole thing if it gets uh, out of hand. Uh, but those thing, kinds of things, be less discipline, less rigor, those kind of things. But they didn't have punishments like, you know, be marooned, for example, left on a, on a deserted island to fend for yourself. You might have to fight somebody else on, on board the ship to, to enforce the violations of their, their code. So, yeah, so not the kind of hundreds or even you know, hundreds of uh, maybe a thousand lashes, that kind of thing didn't happen. But still, some... Um, so just being at sea is really rigorous. I mean, because in an open ship, is a difficult life. And we have a lot of questions, I think, in particular, talking about um, Amelia Island. And one of the questions that was asked is that there have been several flags flown over uh, Amelia Island, and I, I believe Fernandina Beach as well. Um, not just McGregor's flag, but also the Spanish uh, I believe the French for for a certain period of time. So, I mean, what would you say is the reason why so many of these um, individuals who tried to claim the area of Amelia Island ultimately didn't see success? Yes, I believe now the Amelia Island people. Are, anyone on Amelia Island is going to well, we'll probably know this, but I think I believe there's six. Um, I think it's the the Spanish, French, English. Um, mm -hmm. There's an independent. Another independent movement there in the 18 teens as part of the War of 1812. Um, then there's McGregor, Ori, uh, well, I don't know, the, the, then I guess the United States Confederate flag also. So was that eight? Because it's eight, maybe. <laughs> um, uh, maybe I overcounted some there. There's been a lot of flags. So why, why really Island has it? So really Island is a place that's worth fighting over okay, because of its strategic position. It has, it has a, a good port. And strategically positioned by the the border with other other empires, so the Spanish border with England, the uh, Spanish border with the United States. So that that's right there on the borders, worth you know keeping strategically buying. And then as a place to kind of sit and protect the trade through that region. So it's something worth fighting over. But as far as sustaining economically, um, it's much more difficult. So it doesn't have kind of a base that would grow a population and make uh, the defense of that place possible over time. So it has kind of a strange combination of being worth fighting over for strategic reasons, but not sort of strong enough to uh, economically developed enough to kind of grow on its own and to be able to protect itself in the long range. So that makes it vulnerable to capture from, from other places. So I think you put those two things together and that's one of the reasons why you get so, so much turnover in the various flags that have flown over the island. And when you talk about uh, McGregor and his presence at Amelia, at Amelia Island, rather, you mentioned earlier in your presentation that um, he was involved a little bit in some, uh, some, some slave trading. And it made me wonder, um, is there a general perception of uh, pirates and privateers when it comes to the slave trade? I mean, are they all willingly in, uh, engaged in the slave trade? Are they trying to subvert it? Um, and I, I, I use those two terms, you know, pirates and privateers, because I don't oh. know if there's a separate response based on, you know, pirates tended to do this and privateers tended to do that. But I wonder what's what's their attitude tend to be towards slavery? So a couple of different things, as you can imagine, um, you these, you know, large number of people with different motivations. So in, um, in the 18th century and somewhat into the 19th century, uh, slave ships, the ships that were transporting enslaved people from Africa to the Americas, uh, those were often a, a prime recruiting ground for pirates. Uh, the sailors aboard those ships did not like that service. And that was a very unpopular service. It was bad for health. It was dangerous. Uh, that, when I say it's dangerous for the, the sailors, I, this is not meant to, you know, 
put their suffering or anything above the, the, the people they're transporting. But uh, the perception of the uh, the sailors, they don't they want to get off those ships. So, even, so a pirate ship is a step up uh, from being aboard, a sailing aboard a slave ship. Gives you some idea of how horrible it would have been for the people who are being transported. Uh, so in that sense, that's a prime recruiting ground for pirates. Um, at the same time, enslaved people, and it's terrible to say this, but in the 18th and 19th century, they are a valuable commodity. So if they can be transported to shore and sold, that is certainly something that, uh, that uh, uh, pirates are interested in doing. So they can, um, you know, they can make more money off the, off, off the, the, the sale of people. Privateers is a little different. It depends on the legal status of the slave trade in the ship uh, or in the nation that commissions the um, the privateer. There are some cases of, of U.S. privateers during the War of 1812 capturing enslaved people, and it gets really complicated. Uh, the courts have to decide: well, are these goods that are covered by the the prize code, or are these people who are sub subject to the um, anti-slave trade laws, okay, which place do they, do they fall under? Uh, for the enslaved people themselves, you know, they, they actually end up enslaved in the United States regardless. Uh, even if they are found to be um, a subject to the prize code, um, and uh, I'm sorry, even if they're found to be subject to the uh, slave smuggling laws, what usually happens is if a person is, is, is um, found by authorities being smuggled into the United States, they are sold in the United States, uh, but the proceeds of that sale go to the U.S. government. So the enslaved person does not get their freedom. They're not, you know, transported to wherever they came from and, and set free. They are sold. It's just a question of who gets the money, the captors or the, the U.S. government. Okay. So I, I think it's, it's in many cases, the pirates or the privateers are uh, participating in the, in, the, in the slave trade. Uh, what I see in my research is a lot of smuggling that was done um, after uh, the slave trade, the international slave trade becomes illegal in the United States. A lot of that, that smuggling is done by privateers in this period. So they are certainly not above um, transporting those people into the United States and selling them to get value uh, out, of, out of that capture. And it's always, it was always hard for us to, to keep that in mind is that you know, the, from the point of view of the captors, the enslaved people are a kind of property that has value that they can turn into property for themselves. Very fascinating. I had no idea it was that complex in terms mm -hmm. of dealing with uh, those who are enslaved and, and their status and then who's getting that, that funding afterward. Right. Um, it's, one of, it's one of the depressing things you think, well, if they're found by authorities being transported illegally, surely they're set free. But no, they're, they're just sold and the government takes the money instead. So I want us to try to switch gears a little bit now, and we have a question about Ori and, and uh, wanting one for clarification, saying that um, he, I guess, had documents um, supposedly proclaiming himself as the governor of Mexico that allowed him to conduct trade with the United States. Um, how would he have obtained uh, those those types of documents? Yes, thank, thank you very much for that, that question. I, I um did not explain this as fully. I realized as we were going along, I, I, I didn't explain it as fully as I should have. So, uh, so Ori is recruited by this Mexican independence movement. And when he sets himself up in Galveston, a representative of the Mexican government comes and kind of swears him in as the governor uh, officially of uh, Galveston and gives him documents that you know proclaim him to be a governor of that, of that territory. Uh, the Mexican independence movement at this time doesn't really have any kind of like permanent status. Um, they've been crushed, almost completely crushed by Spain. So this kind of these guys who call themselves the Mexican government are issuing already these documents. So it's up to you whether you know how much uh, credence you want to give them. Uh, Ori then takes those documents with him to Amelia Island, and then it does one of the weird things like so Florida is part of Mexico. A Mexico that doesn't really have a functioning government, but rather these guys who call themselves the Mexican government. Uh, so yeah, that's where the that's where the documents come from. But it is a little bit um, uncertain what the legal status of those documents actually is. So thank th thank you for that question. I appreciate that. Well, thank you. And 
you know, with this episode um, with with Ori and, and and some of these other privateers, um, to what extent would you say that it affected negotiations between uh, Florida and Spain when it came to transfer of the United or transfer of Florida uh, from being a Spanish colony to being a to being a U.S. territory? Yeah, so it makes things it makes things complicated, more complicated. Uh, it is certainly something that the Spanish ambassador to the United States screams about. Uh, you know, he goes, he, he goes and yells at um, John Quincy Adams for a while. How could you do this? This is the greatest affront, and you know, this will surely we're, we're you know we, we can't deal with you. You're just going to take our life. Blah 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 blah. But the logic of the situation really takes over. Uh, both sides need the treaty to happen. The United States does certainly because they want that territory. But Spain, by this point, by the late 18 teens, it's pretty clear that they cannot administer that territory. They can't defend it. They're still recovering from Napoleon's invasion. Uh, the other European powers are not really too keen on helping Spain to regain its colonies. Uh, in the settlement after the Napoleonic Wars, Britain is really like is, is Spain's ally. Um, they're not going to help Spain get its colonies back. So it's basically Spain has to make this deal the best deal they can. If they blow it up over uh, what's happening at Amelia Island, they're going to get a much worse deal. The United States wants that territory, so they're not going to blow things up over Amelia Island. So a lot of yelling, um, but not, not it's not anything that changes the overall uh, logic of that's bringing both of those sides together to get that deal done. Okay. Thank you again for that clarification. And I think the last question um, I want to sort of leave you with is that we know that piracy in in some forms um, still sort of exists today um, in, mm -hmm. in, in different parts of the globe. Um, do we have, to, to your knowledge, I mean, are, are privateers um, also things that are that are operating? I mean, we know we have like mercenaries in terms of, of land based forces like that, mm -hmm. but do we have privateers that are getting essentially these like letters from the government and being able to go out and and into you know fight pirates, right? So I read, actually I read, I read a book and re reviewed a book about this this question of uh, making drawing parallels between pirates and uh, uh, I'm sorry privateers in 19th century 18th century and sort of uh, mercenaries and private contractors today, and I cannot for the life of me remember what the name of that book is. Um, uh, but the short answer is no, there are not privateers anymore. There was a uh, international treaty concluded in the 1850s, which forbid uh, a privateering outlawed it, uh, and the United States has never pursued privateering after that point. Um, privateers always made sense as kind of uh, when navies were small and you wanted to convert a kind of merchant force to a war for, uh, force, that made sense. But as, uh, as um, navies got bigger and you know, maintained in peacetime even during by, by governments, there was no longer the desire by governments to kind of share that war making ability. So sort of navies got bigger and crowded out privateering. So there wasn't a function for them to pursue anymore. Uh, Navy vessels, interestingly, na this is not often appreciated, is that naval vessels also got to keep what they captured. They could bring captured vessels into port and have them declare a prize of war and then all of the sailors would get to share uh, a piece of the prize money, just like privateers did. So in many ways, the Navy was a competitor of privateers and kind of drove them out. And no, there's not privateering privateering anymore. For a while, I, I wondered, you know, if I get rich someday and I, if I can uh, donate enough money to a politician, maybe he can slip a, a privateer commission for me into a piece of legislation. No, no, nobody reads all the, the bills that pass or anything. They can slip that in there for me, but no, that, that doesn't happen anymore. So there goes that, that dream of, of having a privateering commission someday. Well, I am very disappointed that you sort of squashed uh, yeah. <laughs> second career as being a privateer. But um, I am grateful for the conversation that we've had this evening. And thank you so much, Dr. Head. And thank you to all of our attendees um, who have tuned in tonight. Uh, we hope to see you again next week. We have two exciting programs that are going to be coming up. And we're going to send you some information about those uh, later this week. And you should be receiving a, um, a evaluation in uh, a short period of time. And again, we'd appreciate it if you could fill that out and let us know how we did this evening. So uh, once again, thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you again soon.